world history appears very much different than even our own time permits us to dream. The history of man is, measured by the history of the plant and animal world upon this planet, to say nothing of the lifespan of the universe, short, an abrupt rise and fall of a few thousand years, something of no account in the destiny of the earth, but for us, who have been born into it, of tragic greatness and power. The Faustian West European culture is the mightiest, most passionate, and through its inner contrast between comprehensive intellectualization and deepest spiritual turmoil, the most tragic culture of all. Here is the struggle between nature and man, who through his historical existence has rebelled against her, practically fought to its end. The mechanization of the world has entered into a stage of most dangerous, excessive tension. The face of the earth, with its plants, animals, and people, has been altered. In a few decades, most of the great forests have disappeared, have been transformed into newspaper, and consequently, climatic changes have occurred, which threaten the agriculture of entire populations. Countless species like the buffalo have been completely or almost completely wiped out. Entire races of men like the North American Indians and the Australian Aborigines have been brought virtually to a state of extinction. Man is an element of all living nature, which rises in rebellion against nature. He must pay for this defiance with his life. Through this act of defiance, man distinguishes himself from all other living things, which, as pure nature, are blended with the tapestry of the natural universe. Mankind is the hero of this tragedy, world history the final act of the tragedy itself. Man is but an episode, a moment in the destiny of the world. The greatest part of the tragedy of human civilization is already past. The end dawns. We stand today at the climax, there, where the fifth act begins. The final decisions will be reached. The tragedy comes to a close. Optimism is cowardice. This is the quote most famously associated with German philosopher of history Oswald Spengler. When he finally published his greatest work, The Decline of the West, in 1918, which he had spent almost a decade writing and refining, it was a resounding success, not only in Weimar Germany but the wider world as well. This is likely due to the book's apparently ominous title and the devastation wrought by the First World War. A reviewer noted that Spengler, like Nietzsche, presented the rare case of a German philosopher who reached the broad public. It was a remarkable achievement. The decline of the West's complexity and erudition makes one wonder just how many who bought a copy actually read it. Nevertheless, the book's success propelled Spengler to the status of minor celebrity, and he was almost immediately faced with a storm of criticism and controversy in response. Some reviewers would smugly nitpick the decline's minor inaccuracies and factual errors, while others would damn the book outright simply due to its attack on the cult of progress. In a 1921 essay, Spengler defended his philosophy from his critics, saying that he had been misunderstood and that his intention was not to imply that the West was heading for catastrophe, but to bring to light the remaining possibilities for Western civilization and present an image of the world to be lived with. He rejected the label of pessimist, pointing out the irony of the so-called optimist who lives by the slogan, it shall be thus, and never reaching it. No, I am not a pessimist, he declared. Pessimism means not to see any more tasks. I see so many unsolved tasks that I fear we shall neither have time nor men enough to go at them. He makes it absolutely clear that the decline of the West was never intended as a pessimistic work, and yet, as time went on, Spengler's views on the future of the West and humanity itself became more and more bleak. By the time he wrote the famous phrase, Optimism is Cowardice, in 1931, his writing had taken on an utterly apocalyptic tone. We will now discover what shaped his growing pessimism and what implications it would have for his philosophy. After the crushing defeat of Germany in 1918, Spengler reportedly broke down and wept openly upon hearing the news that his beloved Germany had lost the war. Like many conservatives at the time, he despised the Weimar Republic, and he quickly set to work publishing essays and giving public lectures about how Germany should be rebuilt. 
His ideal model of government was the aristocratic monarchy that Weimar had replaced, and he appealed to the German nobility to lead in the creation of a new aristocratic German state, with government from the top down by an educated, privileged elite. He even secretly harbored hopes of the eventual restoration of the Hohenzollern monarchy, but his hopes were dashed by the rise of Adolf Hitler and the National Socialist regime, who were ironically partly influenced by Spengler's writings. Hitler represented the opposite of everything Spengler wanted for Germany. For one thing, Spengler viewed his rallies as plebeian rabble-rousing, not something that a man serious about statecraft should be engaging in. Spengler always prided himself on his political realism and held a high opinion of statesmen like Benjamin Disraeli and Otto von Bismarck who reckoned with the political climates of their day without looking through a haze of ideologies and whimsical political desires. He had nothing but disdain for Hitler's fanatical ideological racialism. Spengler's friend recorded in his memoirs that, when speaking about Hitler after a private meeting with him, Spengler remarked, he is a fantasizer, a numbskull, who is wedded to Alfred Rosenberg's myth. When one sits across from him, one does not have even one single time the feeling that he is significant. He still voted for Hitler and even hung a swastika outside his house at one point, suggesting that he thought even the Nazis were preferable to Weimar. Spengler was one of the foremost thinkers of German fascism, but to say he was disappointed in how it turned out would be an understatement. The success of the Nazis was directly the reason for Spengler's deepening pessimism towards the end of his life. His 1933 book, The Hour of Decision, is the origin of the famous phrase, Germany is not an island. No longer was he concerned with building a worthy Third Reich out of the ashes of the Second, now he was worried about the very survival of Germany on the world stage. The book contains several indirect criticisms of the Nazi regime, to the point they had it banned. The second volume that Spengler intended was never written. The Hour of Decision would be the last book Spengler would ever publish before his death in 1936. But of Spengler's later works, it is his short 1931 book, Man and Technics, that is of most significance to us today. This book is the source of his well-known tragic imagery of the Roman soldier at Pompeii, standing dutifully at his post while Vesuvius rains down fire and ash upon him. The man who once emphatically declared that he was not a pessimist was the same man who would now write, Optimism is cowardice. The machine technics will end with the Faustian civilization and one day will lie in fragments, forgotten. Our railways and steamships as dead as the Roman roads and the Chinese wall, our giant cities and skyscrapers in ruins like old Memphis and Babylon. The history of this technics is fast drawing to its inevitable close. It will be eaten up from within, like the grand forms of any and every culture. When, and in what fashion, we know not. Spengler was now proud of what he called his brave pessimism. Man and Technics cemented Spengler's legacy as the master historical pessimist of the West. It could be said that his now extreme pessimism was what made him see the future in such bleak terms, but it could also be argued that it completely cleared his mind of wishful thinking and allowed him to see things as they truly are. However, as Spengler himself wrote in the preface of Man and Technics, the book was actually just a small glimpse into something larger that he had been working on. This larger work has been revealed by scholars in the decades since Spengler's death as a philosophy of history second to his first, that of the decline of the West. It is Oswald Spengler's second philosophy that we will now explore. What is history? The linear theory presents many problems, most notably its Eurocentrism, regarding non-European civilizations as either wholly irrelevant or, at best, contributors to Western civilization. Both Hegel and Marx are guilty of this. It tends to see Greece and Rome as precursors to the modern West, instead of fully independent civilizations in their own right. When was Roman history at an end? 476 AD? That is just a date. The true genius of the decline of the West is that it illuminates when and how a civilization begins and ends, and most importantly, its enunciation of a human culture as the sum of possibilities of its prime symbol. What is possible in one age, for one people, would be impossible in all others. Spengler broke up the linear theory of history, saying that the only type of history that can exist is the self-contained histories of individual civilizations. He points to the reign of Augustus and the onset of Caesarism as the end of Roman history, 
and the thousand years between then and the reign of Otto the Great were, in Spengler's term, historyless. By the time Rome succumbed to the Germanic hordes, it had already been a walking corpse for the past five centuries. Spengler's initial philosophy, the one he expounded in The Decline of the West, had assigned no grand meaning to history as a whole, as the decline itself was an attack on such theories. History for Spengler had consisted of the essentially meaningless rise and fall of high cultures around the world. Early man was historyless, and therefore irrelevant to the histories of the high cultures. But now, in the late phase of his life, he had begun exploring a second philosophy of history, where he intended to uncover the significance of the greater history of man. Due to his untimely death, most of his extensive private writings on it would not be published for decades until a private scholar by the name of Anton Kochtenek compiled Spengler's notes and published them in two separate volumes, which still await translation into English. My primary source for this video is John Farenkopf's book, Prophet of Decline, where he has written a detailed analysis of the later Spengler's writings. Man and Technics sprang from these writings while Spengler was still alive, but it was a very short book, and at first glance, doesn't seem to offer anything significantly new over the decline of the West, other than an indication of Spengler's now utterly apocalyptic outlook towards the future of humanity as a whole. Kochtenek and Farenkopf reveal the true significance of man and technics, and Spengler's second philosophy of history. In the decline of the West, Spengler had never paid any attention to human prehistory. History began in 3500 BC with the high cultures, and anything before that was irrelevant. But now, Spengler finally turned his attention to these formative years of humanity's past. Always disapproving of cause and effect material analysis of history, he analyzed instead the evolution of humanity's spiritual and psychological existence, the same method he had employed in the decline of the West, from the early Paleolithic up until the modern age. He demarcated four stages of human intellectual advancement, labeling them simply A, B, C, and D. A corresponds to the Paleolithic, B the Late Paleolithic, C the Neolithic, and D the era of human high culture from 3500 BC up to now. It needs to be said that Spengler was off by a couple million years with his dating here due to the limited knowledge of prehistory at the time he lived, but this is a relatively minor detail. What matters is his analysis of the gradual evolution of the human psyche from the time of our primitive ancestors to the present day. The A stage is inorganic, lava-like, when the first humans erupted onto the face of the earth as from a volcano. B was when the human intellect first began to crystallize, the transition between inorganic and organic, when humans began to awaken from their animalistic existence and slowly became aware of themselves as individuals. C was when complex human society first emerged, where we see the rise of agriculture, writing, and the division of labor. And of course, D, was around 3500 BC when human civilization first came to form proper with amazingly complex societies that were made possible by the many thousands of years of human intellectual evolution before them. These are the high cultures that Spengler had concerned himself with in the decline of the West. But now he recognized generations of the high cultures, each generation more advanced than the last, going back a bit on his position of absolute relativism he had held when he wrote the decline. The first generation began with Egypt and Babylon, the second with India, Greece and China, and so on. He describes the superior cultural and technological development of the second generation, writing, Here one begins to experience life as a riddle, because it is no longer easy and is not completely self-evident anymore. Thinking, which turns away from proximity and instantaneousness and from directness and immediacy of action, acquires first here a great form. The concerns of life, the deed, becomes more important than mere physical existence. The Greco-Roman, Indian, and Chinese high cultures are more individualistic, more domineering, grapple with more profound experiences, and are proud of these experiences instead of avoiding them. Spengler was constructing a grand narrative of the entire of human history, not in a linear or cyclical pattern, but in a spiral pattern. He still thought of the high cultures themselves as undergoing an independent sequence of growth and decline, but with cultural and technical development increasing in degree with each successive generation. This was quite a departure from what he wrote in The Decline of the West, that history in general had no great aim. Spengler saw this steady rise of the human intellect through history as both fantastic and terrible. He regarded man as a Promethean figure, a beast of prey who exploits nature to build his civilization. 
Civilization is the ultimate expression of man's will to give his own meaning to the world and reshape his surroundings. Artificial, contrary to nature, is every human work, Spengler writes. The prerogative of creation is torn from nature. He began to ominously refer to the high cultures as end cultures. Each successive stage of high culture in history has been more intellectually refined than the last. Spengler believed that Faustian culture was the end of the D stage, the final phase of human development, the final end culture, something that humans have been rushing towards like an avalanche for millennia. Western culture, with its individualism, absolutism and machine industry, is no meaningless coincidence as he had once thought. Always a poet at heart, Spengler likened the entirety of human history to a great play. The first act began hundreds of thousands of years ago, when early humans were just learning to manipulate their environment, and when tens of thousands of years passed by uneventfully. Every subsequent act increases in tempo as the human mind continued to evolve. More abstract intellectuality and creativity, and a more domineering attitude towards the environment. The lifetimes of the high cultures could be measured in centuries. Since the Industrial Revolution, every single year has become significant. The Industrial Revolution represents the final E stage, the opening of the fifth act, when humankind's historical conflict with nature escalated into a veritable war. The play Spengler was writing was an apocalyptic tragedy. Spengler once criticized Nietzsche for not realizing that the will to power only really describes the ethos of Western civilization. He wrote that Confucius, Buddha, and Socrates believed knowledge is virtue, but knowledge is power is a phrase that possesses meaning only for Western man. Historically, the antagonistic forces of God and Satan, Pope and Holy Roman Emperor, theist and atheist, all expose the competitive nature of Western man who is relentlessly driven by the pursuit of power and victory. He seeks to impose, command, control the world. When viewed in this light, it's not surprising that, despite its many supporters, communism never took off in the West, only taking root in countries that already had innate socialistic tendencies deeply embedded in their cultural being, like Russia and China. Capitalism is a late expression of the abstract competitive individualism of Western man, and Western man only. What we have in China today is a blend of Western economics and Confucian ethics, a country that previously had no concept of functional capital like in the West. Communist theory, as a product of Western philosophy, could only have come from a German, a country that has historically been in a very unfavorable geographic position, surrounded by enemies on all sides, necessitating a strong collectivist state where the individual comes second to national unity. Cause and effect historians understand capitalism and the industrial revolution as the product of material causes, but Spengler shows how the roots of capitalism go far deeper than the 18th century. His a-causal view of history sees cultures growing organically as macroscopic holes that are, in a sense, predetermined. For Spengler, the roots of capitalism are in the abstract spatial feeling of Faustian culture, which, in the economic realm, first revealed itself in the form of double-entry bookkeeping in medieval Italy. When Spengler uses the word capitalism, he doesn't mean it in the material sense that it's usually thought of, but as a specific mode of thinking. It's the Faustian will to power in economic form. Business heads and entrepreneurs are its Caesars, the businesses themselves are its legions, and the common workers, the slaves. As we know, the prime symbol of Western culture is infinite space. Spengler described capitalism as a completely impersonal and incorporeal force which radiates its effects in all directions into infinity. The mode of thinking of capitalism is a uniquely dynamic Western form of thinking in numbers. We think of numbers, and by extension money, as function, unlike the ancient Greek who thought of numbers only as physical magnitudes. Faustian money is not minted, Spengler wrote, but thought of. The number zero is used to its fullest potential. For the first time in history, nothing is now definitively something. As soon as a wealthy businessman writes a million on a piece of paper, that million exists. This idea of functional capital would have been an impossibility for the mind of any other civilization. Spengler foresaw the liberation of capitalism from physical coinage, predicting the abandonment of the gold standard, to say nothing of Bitcoin. 
He wrote that the immateriality and inherent instability of capitalism would drive it to throw off all physical limits and create an effectively infinite supply of money, with runaway debt and inflation across the world as a result, a prediction consistent with the global economy today. He described the spectacular rise of the economy since the Industrial Revolution as fantastical, dangerous and almost desperate. He emphasized capitalism's fundamental irrationality, taking issue with Max Weber's view that capitalism is a rational entity because capitalism is inexorably driven by the irrational Faustian longing for power. It cannot be controlled rationally, as history has shown. We are still recovering from the 2008 financial crisis, even as we actively anticipate the next one. Capitalism is not a system by itself. It's tightly bound up with the distinctive abstract ethos of Western culture. But this is only the first pillar of capitalism, of which there are two. The second is the modern age's obsession with material things. Classical civilization had its modern age too, and we can find its counterpart to capitalism in the massive slave economy of the Roman Empire. The Roman slave was permanent and physical. In contrast, the Faustian slave is impermanent and incorporeal, and ideally can be dismissed and replaced at any time. As the name suggests, capitalism values money above all things. Even many of those supposedly opposed to capitalism worship the movement of money in the exact same way, for there is no philosophy more obsessed with capitalism than Marxism. These are both products of our materialist age. So, was it capitalism that created the Industrial Revolution? You might have guessed that the answer is no. I mentioned earlier how double-entry bookkeeping was the earliest sign of a dynamic economic force that would eventually become capitalism. Similarly, the invention of the mechanical clock around the same time shows that, even from its earliest stages, Western culture and the machine are inseparable. Here, again, we have the will to power. Other civilizations simply use nature. By contrast, Western man dominates it and rapes it. The discovery of the steam engine upset everything and transformed economic life from the foundations up, Spengler writes. Till then, nature had rendered services, but now she was tied up as a slave, and her work was, as though in contempt, measured by a standard of horsepower. Marx regarded industrial society as a permanent fixture of human civilization, but Spengler saw it as a transient phenomenon. In his view, industry and capitalism are not material phenomena, but uniquely Western forms of thought. Industrial technology is indivisible only from Western civilization, which has a deep cultural historical need to dominate and control all things, especially its environment. The Chinese and the Russians use technology, but they don't long for it as Western man does. They see it only as the source of the West's military and economic supremacy, and a weapon in their fight against Western imperialism. Western man, Spengler stressed, has become a slave of his own creation. Capitalism and the machine have become a feedback loop. As the needs of capitalism grow, so too does the machine industry require to support it, which, in turn, only blazes new paths for the further growth of capitalism. Feedback loops are unstable. Spengler foresaw the catastrophic long-term effects of industrial society on the environment as early as the First World War, which he believed would get exponentially worse over time as the global machine economy continued its meteoric growth. It was only later in his thinking that this would become the grand apocalyptic crescendo of all human history. Once again, he was remarkably prescient. Active climate change has only been known about since the 60s, and more than half of all industrial CO2 pollution ever produced has been emitted since 1988. The 2010s saw the first real consequences of climate change, and the apocalyptic wildfires across the planet are a sign that things are already beginning to spiral out of control. And yet, people still have hope that we can fight it, that we can somehow stop runaway climate change. We need to act now, they cry. The cost of doing nothing is ever increasing. But the future is never as malleable as political idealists would like to believe. It's time to be realistic. We are long past arguing about whether or not we can stop it. The real issue going into the 2020s is how we intend to survive it. It is already too late to avert global ecological catastrophe. Spengler's contention that this is and has always been the ultimate destiny of humanity requires some serious consideration. If he is right, then the climate crisis should not be understood as a manageable side effect of industrial civilization, but rather its only possible outcome. The crisis is irresolvable.
We have seen that the early Spengler was active in political theory during the interwar period. The most famous of his political tracts, Prussianism and Socialism, was a highly influential work among thinkers of the German Conservative Revolution, where he described how global capitalism would be smashed by German ethical socialism. It is a sad irony how Spengler would often remind his readers that the great political theorizers like Marx, Plato or Moti often unintentionally paved the way for brutal tyranny based on their ideas when his own writings directly contributed to the rise of Nazism. He became deeply depressed in his later years. His black pessimism shaped his second philosophy of history, where he had abandoned all hope of a bright future, and indeed had come to believe that the ultimate destiny of all humanity is that it will tragically destroy itself in its millennia-long quest to gain spiritual and technical mastery over the earth. In Spengler's view, the total war that the West wages against nature in the form of machine economics is the climax of a centuries-long historical process, a process tightly bound up with the greater cosmic process of human history itself. It remains to be seen whether this last and darkest of Spengler's prophecies will be fulfilled. Spengler concludes, Higher man is a tragedy. With his grave, he leaves the world behind the battlefield and wasteland. He has drawn plants and animals, the sea and mountains into his decline. He has painted the face of the world with blood, deformed and mutilated it, but there was greatness in it. When he is no more, his destiny will have been great.